We probably all heard someone older than us use the phrase, they just don't make stuff like they used to, as they slap their still working 70 year old refrigerator that accounts for more than half their power bill. More often than not, this is a logical fallacy called survivorship bias, or the perception that because my 70 year old refrigerator still works, that by extension, everything back in the good old days was just built better than the crap available now. Never mind the fact that pretty much everything else from that era has ended up in the landfills except for my 70 year old refrigerator. Now it is true that the average lifespan of consumer products has decreased slightly over the last several decades. Now, a lot of pessimists will just blame everything on planned obsolescence, that products are designed to fail after a set period of time. However, I'm more of a believer in globalization and that at the end of the day, consumers want to replace their old stuff with the latest and greatest at the lowest prices possible, which has pushed companies to develop cheaper manufacturing processes to open up their product segment to a larger market. So now we get to this video, keyboards. What does this have to do with keyboards? Well, modern keyboards suck and they've sucked for a long time. The IBM Model F, which is regarded by many to be the best keyboard to have ever existed, is nearly 40 years old. Why hasn't there been a better keyboard in 40 years, you ask? Well, it's actually pretty simple, and that's that making these keyboards was insanely expensive. In 1981, IBM's manufacturing costs, not the sales price, were estimated to be around 600 US dollars with inflation. Why on earth would IBM spend $600 to make a keyboard? Well, there's actually a number of reasons as to why. For one, Model F was sold with the original IBM PC, a computer targeted for low volume consumer use. Secondly, they hadn't yet developed a technology to make the keyboard significantly cheaper while maintaining the same high reliability. And once they had, they released the much cheaper Model M. Lastly, the computers were expected to be used for a long time and as a result, commanded a higher price tag for higher reliability. However, once Moore's law manifested itself and technology got significantly more powerful in a very short period of time, focus on product longevity decreased and price became more of a forefront focus. Nowadays, most keyboards that come with desktop computers use rubber dome switches, which are very inexpensive and highly reliable. Most modern keyboards cost less than $5 to manufacture. Now, mechanical keyboards, which uses slightly older technology, have reignited. They've picked up steam in the last few years in the PC enthusiast and gaming markets, but they're generally pretty low quality and attempt to use features like macros and RGB LEDs to warrant their much higher price tag than membrane keyboards. But in a weird corner of the internet, we have the mech keys master race. Forums filled with thousands of people that spend hundreds of dollars on parts and build their own DIY keyboards, in part to save on manufacturing costs, but mostly to make their keyboards exactly how they want. Now, I've been using a DOS Ultimate 4 with Cherry MX Blue key switches the last few years. It's a decent mechanical keyboard and I, I really liked it a lot, but quickly found out after a few minutes of Googling that apparently it sucked and I was an idiot for ever liking it. So I've decided to build my own mechanical keyboard and see what all of this hubbub is about. First, we start with the DZ60 PCB, which will be the brain of this build. It supports USB-C, underglow RGB LED, which I won't be using because I'm not 12, and it's fully programmable so I can make each key do whatever I want, including macros, system functions like volume, brightness, media keys, etc. And I can even make it cooperate exactly like a native Mac OS keyboard, which is super nice. Now, before entering a point of no return, I tested the PCB to ensure proper operation by shorting each key area with a pair of tweezers and some keyboard tester software that I found online. And once I ensured everything was working, I installed all of my stabilizers. These, surprise, surprise, stabilize the longer keycaps like the spacebar, return, shift, etc. And they kind of just snap very easily into place. Once I did that, it was time to install my key switches. Now I opted for the Kale Box Heavy Burnt Orange. Say that 10 times fast. These are switches with a tactile bump. So there's, there's kind of a bump in the actuation, but it isn't clicky and therefore pretty quiet. It's generally referred to as a less scratchy and generally improved Cherry MX Clear. Now, if that made no sense, don't worry about it. It will soon when you hear the sound test. The key switches really snap very nicely into this CNC'd aluminum plate, which adds rigidity to the PCB. And once all of the switches have been fitted, it's pretty much just time to pass the pins through the back of the board and start soldering. 
Now, if you've never soldered before, this is a really great project to start with because I, it's very easy. I've only done a couple of soldering projects and it went without a hitch. Now, once my board was all soldered, I tested all of the switches again, just to make sure that I had soldered everything properly. And voila, every switch works perfectly. No need to resolder anything. Nice. <laughs> now we're going to fit the finished board inside of this KBD Fans Tofu aluminum case. I went with their gorgeous chocolate color, but they have a variety of colors. I screw the board down into place, and then I started fitting the gorgeous SA double shot ABS keycaps, which are shaped spherically rather than squared off, so they give kind of a retro vibe. But they're also sculpted, which slopes the rows for an allegedly more comfortable typing experience. And I can attest to that. Now the keyboard might be finished, but I can't go plugging any random ghastly USB-C cable into my beautiful new board, so I'm going to make one of those too. Believe it or not, making a USB-C cable is actually pretty easy. I have the four core cable itself, two layers of nylon sleeving to match the blue color of my keycaps, one of these totally unnecessary but trendy quick disconnect connectors for nut jobs with multiple keyboards, I just bought one because I think it looks cool, <laughs> and of course the USB-C connectors, which are actually unidirectional given the really long length of the cable and low power consumption of the keyboard itself. So I do need to install each of these on its proper end. Now, once the cable is properly sleeved, it's time to do something completely unnecessary and entirely for looks. <laughs> That's coiling the cable. I tape the cable down with strong electrical tape and then wrap the cable around this metal rod that I have as tightly as possible. Now, once I've coiled the cable to the amount that I want, I tape the other end down and then blast it with a heat gun for a couple minutes. And the end goal is to get it hot enough that it kind of molds itself into place, but not so hot that you actually ruin the cable. Once it's hot and toasty, I let it cool for a couple of minutes and then remove it from the uh, rod to see if it works. And hey, look at that. A perfect, gorgeously coiled cable. Then I solder on the connectors, apply some brown heat shrink to match the case, and I'm set. This build costs just shy of $300 and a couple hours of assembly, which is an insane amount of money. <laughs> I, I realize that. So the question is, is it worth it? Well, for most normal people, no. I mean, $300 isn't much less than a fully fledged computer. That said, I type a lot, and when compared to my DOS Ultimate 4, it is a significantly nicer keyboard, and the switches and keycaps feel amazing. I understand why people get obsessed with keyboards. Now, I'm not going to go out and spend thousands of dollars on them, but I get it now. And now that I have this one, I'm never going back to a cheap keyboard ever again. Well, folks, that's all for me. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, that other button works okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome tech videos like these, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.